Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study, and we are looking at Acts chapter 2 and verse number 42 as we think about the early church and the activities in which they were involved. And we're happy that those of you who are joining us by the internet can do so, and us here in this place. Uh, we're happy to be back. Last week we had a little bit of a challenge with our health, but uh, we're glad to be back tonight. Well, uh, we have been looking from Acts chapter 2. We pointed out that in Acts chapter 1, uh, the Lord gave his disciples some instructions. He told them to wait in Jerusalem there for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And that took place in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came upon them and he filled them. And um, these, some of these people were involved in speaking in other languages, specific known languages, uh, particularly for the benefit of the Jews that had come in from different parts of the world uh, to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And we noted in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 42, it says they continued, that is the early Christians, who had changed their mind in Acts 2.38. It says Peter told them to repent or change their mind about Jesus. And they did, and they were uh, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ because of the remission of sins, that word in verse 38 uh, could and should be translated because of the remission of sins. And then we also notice that this early group of people consisting of Jewish um, individuals, they believed, and it says that 3,000 of them were added to the church. And then verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Now when we talk about doctrine, what kind of doctrines are there in Scripture according to uh, Titus chapter 1 verse 9. Do you remember? Two kinds of doctrines that you find, you find in the scriptures. Kind to be practiced. Okay, there's a kind to be practiced and then there's a kind that is just to be believed. Now in 2 Timothy 2, 15, uh, 3.16 it says all scriptures God breathed, it's profitable for doctrine. Now that word that's used there is the word that would include everything that is to be believed. Okay. So all of the Bible, of the 66 books of the Bible, are to, be, are to be believed, but not all of the Bible is to be believed and practiced. So we pointed that out to you, and of course this basically has to do with the idea of what dispensations are all about. And 1 Timothy 2.15 says, rightly dividing the word of truth. So uh, when you interpret the Bible normally, you... Uh, come out with a dispensational distinction. You recognize that there are differences between the Old and the New Testament. So we were talking about the different kinds uh, of doctrine. And then we were talking last week about fellowship. And we pointed out that these early Christians uh, had some things in common. Now they had uh, a common faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, there were a lot of people who knew uh, many things about Jesus. Many of them knew that Christ died on a cross. Is it enough for a person to believe that Christ died or that Christ died on a cross? Is that enough for a person to, be, to believe in order to be saved? Why not? He's not dead. <clears throat> okay, he has, he has to be a living Savior, but some people will believe, there are many people who saw Jesus die, but just because he died does not mean that they're saved. So there are people who can believe who don't know the facts of the gospel, uh, that Christ died for our sins as our substitute. They don't know that he was really buried for three days. They don't know that he rose again bodily from the grave. Or even if they know and believe those facts, does not automatically guarantee that these people are safe. They must personally transfer their trust over to the person and work of Jesus Christ through the message of the gospel. Now, there's a lot of uh, people out there that you know, talk about the gospel. And uh, they say, well, you got to believe the gospel. And they have to tell people what the gospel is. Well, the gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. And it's that Christ died for our sins. Not for you because you're a wonderful person, but because we're, we're all sinners and we all deserve to be eternally separated from God. But God the Father loved the world and he sent the Son to take the penalty that we all deserved. And that's how we can have eternal life. <laughs> when we believe in Christ as our Savior. So we have the same uh, Savior, we're, we're saved. And then we also looked at the matter of our baptism by the Holy Spirit. Now what kind of baptisms are there? 
two, two categories. Okay, there's wet baptism and there's dry baptism. Okay, uh, wet baptism is what takes place when a person believes in Christ and is immersed. And that wet baptism of a Christian picture is what? It pictures are death, burial, and resurrection with Christ. See, so that's what water baptism pictures. But then also these people were baptized spiritually into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1. You will be baptized by the Holy Spirit not many days hence. Now that's not the baptism of fire that will be yet future, but this was a baptism of the Holy Spirit that took place on the day of Pentecost when all these people who had believed in Christ were placed into a new entity. And what's the new entity called? For by one spirit you were all baptized into what? Into Christ or the Christ. And the, the new creation, Ephesians 2.15, is, is called the Christ. Jesus is the head of the church, the only head of the church. There's only one mediator, 1 Peter 2.5.9, or 2.5, not 1 Peter, uh, 1 Timothy 2.5, where there's only one mediator. We don't pray to Mary. Uh, we don't have anybody between us and God except the Father except Jesus Christ. We as New Testament believers can go directly to the Father through the merits of the Son, who is our high priest. So we were baptized by the whole, or the people on the day of Pentecost were baptized into the body of Christ. And today, uh, a person upon his or her believing in Christ as personal Savior, that person is instantly taken out of the kingdom of darkness, according to Colossians 1.13, and placed into the kingdom of God's dear Son. So that's how we become a part of this new creation. And when we see ourselves in this new creation, then we can begin to function or ought to begin to function with the gift of love that God has given to us. Well, you'd think that guy would stop sawing by now. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so we, we have the, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, of course, uh, water baptism. And I, in the notes that I've given you there, on the, do you all have that? Do you, John, you have the blue sheet here? On, okay. Uh, if you go to uh, gotquestions.org, he talks about the seven baptisms that are mentioned in the scripture, and you can check that out on your own. Now, we uh, also talked about uh, point number C would be also, we have all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. Now, if you would go with me to first, uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and... Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 3. Let's just look at some of the things that uh, he talks about here that are part of the spiritual blessings that are ours to enjoy <coughs> right now. So if you have uh, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, page 1619, if you have a Schofield Study Bible, and for those of you who don't have one, I would recommend you get one. You can get one for, I think, under 40 bucks. I know under 50 bucks for sure, but it's a good investment. So Ephesians 1, 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with a few blessings here and there. What does it say? Every, Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Notice in verse number 4, he chose us in him when? Before the foundation of the world. You see, now, God's being omniscient, he knew when and where... And and to whom we would be born. He knew all about us. Uh, Psalm 139 tells us that even when we were conceived in the womb, he knew all about us. So he knows everything about us. He's omniscient. But it says he chose us. Now let's look at a few verses that correlate to his choosing us or electing us. Let's go to John chapter 15 and verse number 16. And uh, this is where Jesus, in his upper room discourse, is giving his disciples... Uh, some new information. And uh, somebody read John 15, 16 for me, please. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Okay, notice that it says, 
You did not, Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you, having chosen you, to do what? To go and bear fruit. Now, what could fruit entail? What are some of the things that uh, fruit might entail? The fruit that he talks other about. Christians. Okay. It could be other Christians that you lead to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Sometimes that's the only emphasis that some people talk about, but that is certainly uh, an important part of our fruit bearing is that we ought to be involved in uh, trying to share the gospel with others clearly so they have someone in whom they might believe in order to be saved. But I've written down a few other things here that I picked up uh, from the Ryrie's uh, So Great Salvation uh, yeah, So Great Salvation book that he has. And if you want to just jot down some of the things, he says fruit can relate to Christian character. Uh, we know that Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. So if you uh, have this in your life, now in order for the Holy Spirit to produce this kind of fruit in your life, you have to be rightly related to him with your known sins confessed to him. See? So it could involve, uh, fruit could involve Christ-like character. So when other people look at you and your life, they'll see that there are some qualities in your life that are Christ-like. Now, we can't produce these. These are produced by the Holy Spirit, but it's our responsibility to direct the fruit properly as opposed to improperly. Now, how could you, for example, misdirect God's love? How could you misdirect God's love as a maturing believer? Uh, well, I'm thinking of that passage in 1 John 2.15. He says to the maturing young men and the spiritual father quality people, he says, you guys stop loving the world system. See, so it's possible for, you see, a carnal Christian won't have God's love to misdirect. He might have a phileo type love. And that's what uh, James chapter 4 talks about. He says, you adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know the friendship of the world is enmity with God? So, you know, unsa uh, unsaved people don't have this God's agape love, and carnal Christians don't have God's agape love. But spirit-filled Christians that are being directed by the Holy Spirit, they have this love that they can and should direct properly. So instead of directing it toward God, they direct it toward the world system. Are you following me? So he says, stop doing that. Now, you, according to 1 Corinthians 7, 31, we're to use the world system, but we're not to abuse it. See? So uh, if we understand that, it'll help us. So it, first of all, it could be involved Christ-like character. And then it could also, according to Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 10, it could be a life that is characterized by good works. You see, when you do, do the good works that God the Holy Spirit prompts you to do that are in line with the clear teachings of the Word of God, then this is also considered fruit. Okay, so it would be a life that is characterized by good works. You have in Ephesians 2.10, we are created in Christ unto good works, right? So God has certain things he wants us to do. So if you are, Romans 8.14 says, those that are habitually being led by the Spirit of God, these are the maturing sons of God, see? So uh, we, uh, we've talked about the idea of, uh, you know, we were talking about the other day about knowing the will of God. Okay, there are 12 things that are specifically identified in Scripture as being the desirous will of God. Well, when you're doing those things, you know, that's why it's important to have that list to say, okay, am I doing these things? And then if I'm doing these things and I'm rightly related to the Holy Spirit, not grieving Him, uh, by allowing known sins to exist in my life or sinning against him or quenching him by saying no to the leading of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit can and will lead us into doing the things that he desires for us to do. So if you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading in your life, uh, he'll oftentimes bring into your life people that he wants you to talk to about the Lord or maybe they're saved people but they're out of fellowship with God so you could be an instrument in God's hand to help these people now it may be indirectly like you're doing you know with teaching little children about songs you know. and uh, you know there's there's always more than one way to get through to people and sometimes you know we can we can have more of an impact maybe on our grandchildren than we can on our children 
who might either be unsaved or out of fellowship with God. So uh, it could involve, number one, Christ-like character. It could secondly involve a life that is characterized by good works. Uh, thirdly, it could involve our being a faithful witness, as uh, Edie mentioned, 1 Corinthians uh, 16, 15. When you're a, a good witness for the Lord, that is considered by the Lord to be uh, a fruit. And then a fourth thing is found in Hebrews 13, 15, which involves a pair of lips that praise God. When you and I praise God or thank him uh, in the midst of other people, instead of, you know, using profanity and all that kind of stuff, you, you just say, well, thank you, Lord, or praise the Lord. You see, people will pick up on that, see, and they'll notice that your, your words are different than their words. And I, you know, the song that you teach the children, I'll, I'll never forget that probably if I have my brain, because my mother used to pray that Psalm 19, 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. So when you have a heart that is full of the fruit of the Spirit, then, uh, which involves the nine parts, then you direct them properly, then people will see Christ living his life through your life. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what I think it's uh, Galatians 4.19, I think it, is, it says, until Christ be formed in you. See, so... God indwells us, and he wants to us to, as it were, get out of the way, just be the vessel that he can use to bring glory to himself through the things that we say and the things that we do. And then uh, a, a sixth or fifth thing, so we have Christ-like character, that would be uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, uh, a life characterized by good works, that's Colossians uh, 1, 10. A faithful witness, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 15. A pair of lips that praise the Lord would be uh, Hebrews 13, 15. And then also generous giving of one's money. Uh, this is found in uh, Romans 15, 28, as well as in Philippians chapter 4, verse 17, where uh, when you give uh, to uh, promote the work of the Lord, and I think it Primarily, it should be in the local church, although it doesn't have to be exclusively. But I think, you know, that's the primary place through which our giving should go. And so this is the, he says, the things that you will bear fruit. And uh, going here in chapter uh, chapter 15, where Jesus says, I am the true vine, my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that bears fruit, he takes away that it may bear more fruit, and then much fruit. See, so God wants fruit to be being produced in our life. So when he saves us in John 15, 16, he says it's that you would bring forth fruit. So he chooses us for a purpose. Okay, And uh, why God selects some and not others, we don't know. But if you have been selected or chosen by God, you just give thanks. He says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. See, And uh, this corresponds with Romans 3.10, there's none who seeks God. Uh, so... This has to go getting back to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 4. It says he chose us in him before the foundation of the word that we should be holy, notice, also, and without blame before him in love. So God also wants us to live holy lives. Now, we cannot live holy lives exactly as God does, but First Peter 1, 15 and 16 says, Be holy, for I am holy. So he wants us to be morally pure. And the way we are to be morally pure is to learn how to walk by means of the Spirit. Uh, Galatians 5.16, walk in your overall manner of life by means of the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the desires that come from your sin nature. And then verse 25, Galatians 5 says, walk each step. Order your life under the control of the Holy Spirit. When you're tempted in the area of the works of the flesh, you say, okay, God, I don't want to pursue this. I don't want to end up doing this thing. So take over this desire and kill that desire that I have. It's, you know, the desire isn't the sin. It's yielding to the sin, to the desire that becomes sin. Does that make sense? So just because you have a temptation in a particular area, don't say, ah, I'm tempted, so I might as well do it. Well, no. The reason he allows you to be tempted is to give you and me the opportunity to demonstrate our greater love for him than the temporary pleasure we would get by engaging in a particular activity, right? I mean, it, it wouldn't be a real temptation to you if 
you know, it didn't have a strong drawing. See, and uh, James uses that illustration in, in James chapter one. He says, like a fly fisherman. See, he knows what kind of fly to put out there, and he when the fish you know, he, and he looks at it, and it comes in, and he goes after it, and he gets caught. See? So, okay. So then also notice in Ephesians chapter one, <coughs> verse five. It says, he predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Uh, a lot of people get mixed up in this area of predestination. And uh, Dr. Schofield has a note there, if you'll notice in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. But I want to take us back to uh, Romans chapter 8, if you would go there with me. And uh, I'll try to make it as simple as I can in my understanding. It says in Romans 8, 28, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Interesting uh, qualification here. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you're necessarily loving God. So that's an interesting point. To those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be what? Conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now notice he wants us to be conformed to the image of his son. Now in order for him, for us to be conformed to the image of his son, let's picture in our minds a huge piece of marble. Think, think of yourself as being Michelangelo, okay? He gets this huge piece of marble from the quarry. It's sitting in his studio there. And what does he have to do to create a beautiful image of what's in his mind? What does he have to do? First smooth off the rough, rough edges. Okay, he uses his hammer and his chisel to get away, get rid of everything that doesn't, isn't going to be the way it's supposed to be. Okay, so as you think about, now I've never done any sculpturing, and so I don't know what it would really be like or how tedious it would be, but just think, he, here's this huge piece of marble, and he's got in his mind what he wants to say it's King David or whatever. Okay, so he wants, he's got this in his mind, so he starts chipping away, he starts chipping away. And, uh, or maybe you've seen a nice sculptor. Ever seen ice sculpturing? Okay, let's think of that, because uh, that maybe is easy. So these guys are really good at, the, you know, they'll do all these things, and they get rid of everything that just isn't supposed to be there. Okay, well, when we start out in our Christian life, more positionally, set aside unto God, and positionally, there's a difference between our position and our practice. So to bring the level of our practice up to the level of our position, because in Christ, God sees us as already seated with Christ in the heavenlies, right? Positionally. Practically, however, there's a lot of chips that need to get chipped away and sandpapered down. And what does God use to get rid of the things that don't measure up to the image of Christ. What what can the Lord use to chip away at us? Tests. Tests that might come from whom? Okay, from other people or even other Christians. You see, that's why it says in 1 Timothy 2, 1, give thanks for all kinds of people. See, the people that God brings into your life, uh, God desires to use those people. See, And so if somebody, for example, bring something to your attention that doesn't seem to be Christ-like, then you might say, well, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I, I will, with God's help, I'll, I'll make this adjustment in my life, see. But usually we get real defensive, you know, who are you to tell me, you know, all that kind of stuff. But if we will, you know, accept the reproof from another person, and hopefully it will be from someone who has our best interests in mind, but you think about 2 Timothy 3, uh, 15, 16, uh, 17, okay, Scripture is good for, profitable for doctrine, for what? Reproof. Reproof, correcting us, and instructing in righteousness. Now, we don't like the reproving, usually, especially as, if it's somebody that, you know, keeps rubbing us the wrong way. But if we respond properly to the reproofs of life, whether it's another individual, saved or not, or it's the Word of God itself, as we read it and say, man, I... I'm, I shouldn't be doing that, see. But I want to do it. Well, I know. That's why you have to say, okay, which is more beneficial in the long run? Pleasing God, right? Uh, we're accepted in the beloved. Let me take you over to 
Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, along this line, just came to my mind. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in the context of uh, his talking about what happens to us at the moment of our physical death, it says, uh, as soon as this tent is struck down, we have a, uh, another building made with eternal hands in the heavenlies, which tells us, in essence, when you die, uh, your soul and spirit depart from the body, and that soul and spirit gets a temporary body to house the soul and spirit until the time of the rapture. Okay, so uh, your husband, for example, you know, his body's out here in, in the cemetery, okay? But his soul and spirit departed from that body, went into the presence of the Lord. He has a temporary body, not the one that he's going to get ultimately, because that body that's out there in the cemetery is going to get raised someday and made like Christ's resurrected, glorified body. Not his deity, but like Christ's body. So that body is going to be reclaimed, a temporary. Now, but notice in, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, and... Uh, Let's look at verse number 9. Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, that is present here on earth or absent, we may be what? Well-pleasing to him. Now please notice it says, not every Christian is well-pleasing to God. Now God knows everything you do. He knows everything you think about. He knows everything you say. He knows everything about you. And there are times when we grieve God, right? Did your children, as they were growing up, did they ever grieve you? Did you ever grieve your parents? We all did, didn't we? Unless you're like my wife. You know? uh, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether it is good or bad. Or actually, the Greek is the idea of worthless. So it's either going to stand the test that God's going to put it to, or it's going to be something that is just worthless, and if it's worthless, it gets burned up or cast aside. <laughs> Now this corresponds with what you have in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as you think about the Bema Seat Judgment. It says uh, in 1 Corinthians 3.12, um, If anyone builds on the foundation, which is Christ, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear because the day will declare it, the day of Christ or the rapture, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort or what quality. Now notice it's the works, not the person. You see that? It's the works that the person has done. If anyone's work, which he has done, endures, he will receive a reward from the Lord. If not, it's going to get burned up. He'll suffer loss of what? Salvation? No. Of his reward. Okay. But he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. So he says, you know, that we need to recognize that the only way we have expressing ourselves is through the body that we have, and we need to recognize that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so let him have his way, keep it clean, and useful in the service for the Lord. Okay, so getting back to Romans chapter 8, verse 29, in my understanding that predestination uh, in part, uh, in addition to God's you know, knowing everything that's going to happen, uh, I see it in the area in reference to myself is he has determined ahead of time the means by which he's going to bring me to spiritual maturity. He knows what my besetting sins are. He knows what your besetting sins are. He knows what you're most likely to give in to. So he periodically, he doesn't tempt us himself, but he allows us to be tempted in a particular area to give us an opportunity to demonstrate we love God more or we love this temporary pleasure. So as we... Uh, are given this opportunity to express our love for God, then we are being more and more conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. I want people, when they look at me, to, to say, are you a Christian? Not, you know, doubting, but, you know, or, you know I, I hope that they'll see Christ living out his life through me by the things that I say, by the way that I do things, you know, and, you know, I'm like everybody else. I, you know, I sometimes do things selfishly or motivated by, you know, the wrong thing. And when I become aware of it, I need to not only apologize to the Lord, but I need to, that is to confess to the Lord. And before you confess to the Lord, you have to discern what you've done. First Corinthians chapter 11, you need to discern what you've done. Secondly, you need to repent or change your mind about what you've done. And then you need to confess it to the Lord. 
So those three steps, you discern what you did, you could repent, you know, don't let these people, you know, think, you know, you gotta stop, and they misuse that word often. The word repent means to change your mind. So you change your mind about what you did, and then you confess your sins to the Lord. And that's a very important thing to do. Now there's a man who says that as Christians we don't have to confess our sins because they were already taken care of at the cross. No. First John 1 John 1.9 is written to Christians. If, or verse 8 say, if you say you have no sin nature, which he says a Christian doesn't have, you're just deceiving yourself. He says, 1 John 1, 9, confessing your sins, that's what unsaved people do. Well, if you had to confess every sin you've ever committed in your life before you could get saved, would you be saved today? Can you remember them all? You can't, can you? See, And they'll usually take a passage like Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and that's written to Jews, uh, and they had to acknowledge the deity of Christ in order to be saved, but then these same people take that word Lord and they say, well, you have to make Jesus the Lord and master of your life as a condition for your being saved. And so many people are confused by, you know, the, the games that are being played. We're saved one way, by grace through faith in Christ, by believing that he died for our sins, rose again, and trusting in him alone. So that's how we're saved. You don't add, adding to or subtracting from the gospel or the means by which we're to be saved is doing something wrong. So, it's very terrible. So, uh, notice he says we're, we're in the process of being conformed into the image of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren, then predestined, uh, and then also justified, and then also eventually will be glorified. See, uh, will be made like unto the Lord. So, getting back to our passage in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, he says we are chosen, and then we are also uh, predestined and then also notice here he goes on to say that we are adopted now this adoption is a little different than what we normally think of in adoption this adoption has to do with our being placed as mature sons uh, when you become of age uh, in the Jewish community which is I think about 13 you became a man and there were certain responsibilities and you know, things that you had, you were considered a man. Well, as soon as you are saved as a Christian, God not only makes you a child of God, but he also says you are adopted and I treat you like a mature son. Okay, so being treated as a mature son means that you have to rely upon God to behave yourself as a mature son ought to behave, right? Or daughter. So he expects you right from the get-go, start acting like a mature son. Now, humanly speaking, that's not possible. And that's why learning how to be uh, re rightly related to the Holy Spirit is going to make a big, big difference in a person's life. And um, too often the Holy Spirit, his ministry is minimized, or in some cases it's overemphasized. Now, the Holy Spirit does not like to draw attention to himself. He likes to draw attention to God the Son, but at the same time we must not ignore the work of the Holy Spirit on our lives. Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, then also notice here, uh, we have been adopted, and this is all verse number five, according to the good pleasure of his will. And then notice verse number six, another thing here, uh, and then we'll maybe wrap it up here. We've been accepted in the beloved. Now this is really uh, mind-boggling to think that we who are sinners, when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, God the Father accepts us the same way he accepts his only begotten Son. Now, why does he do that? Because he sees at the time of our salvation, he takes our, he takes our sins and they are transferred over on to his Son. And Christ's righteousness is transferred and put over onto us. So when God looks at you and me as believers, he sees us the same way he sees his son. Now this is obviously positional truth. See? So when he accepts me, I am accepted. I can never be lost. I am accepted. I am a child of God. I am a mature son of God. I'm adopted. I am accepted in the beloved 
And God the Father accepts me the same way that he accepts his only begotten Son. I tell you, that is just mind-boggling to think, you know. But that's the kind of love to be accepted in the beloved. Um, in the same way that God the Son is accepted by the Father. And that's, as I said, that has to do with positional truth. And that's why he says now, okay, since this is true in the mind of God, he says, I want you to live your life in such a manner that you display that before others as one who's accepted in the family. Uh, sometimes I tell my children, uh, you belong to the peach family, behave like a peach. And don't disgrace the family name. Now, we as God's children, we oftentimes disgrace the family name, don't we? Our Heavenly Father's name. See? But we're not supposed to do that. So, And then uh, notice uh, verse number 7. We'll look at, that's just the matter. We've been redeemed. Uh, we've been purchased. And the price of the purchase was what? With what did Jesus purchase us so that we could enter into heaven? His blood. His own precious blood. See, so he purchased us. So if he purchased us, then who really belong? To whom do we belong? Jesus. We belong to him. We belong to God, and so we ought to recognize he bought us out of the slave market of sin. See, we don't have to obey our former boss, the devil, anymore. See, when he gives you an order, you say, "Get lost, buddy." Now, you, you deal with him differently than that, but you know you have to rely upon the Holy Spirit. We'll look at that couple weeks here from Ephesians chapter 5. And then notice also here we have verse number 7, the forgiveness of our sins. Now, there's judicial forgiveness and family forgiveness. The same guy I was talking about here, uh, he doesn't make the distinction between judicial forgiveness and family forgiveness. Uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we should confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. See, when you Trust in Christ as your Savior, you are judicially forgiven. I have here uh, a sheet that I uh, got from, uh, uh, it's called Two Aspects of Forgiveness by George Zeller, the Middleton Bible Church. If you're interested, I can either show this to you. But it, there's a big difference between family fellowship and or forgiven, judicial forgiveness and family forgiveness. See, you're going to, you're going to sin periodically, see. You still have a sin nature, right? Okay. If you say you don't, you're just deceiving yourself. And I don't know how somebody can say, you know, Christians don't have a sin nature. It's pretty obvious to me. You know, what Paul struggles with in, in Romans chapter 7, verse 15 through 25, you know. And uh, it just, you know, there, there's some serious problems that stem from somebody who, somebody who says, you know, you only have one nature. You don't still have a sin nature. That's where most of our problems come from. So he talks about the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. And then he goes on to discuss other things. So here are just a few of the things that are some of the riches that we have in Christ and which these early Christians, they, they themselves had these things. But they would have had to have somebody explain or teach them these things and explain them to them, right? Uh, for example, when your children were born into your family, they didn't know whether you had riches or not, did they? See, you had to you had to tell them, you know, as you, your child, you know, this is part of what you have as a child of God, you know. And so that's true with reference to these early Christians. They didn't understand all this. And of course, Paul, he wasn't saved for quite a quite a period of time. And then when he came on the scene. He was given this information from God the Son in his seminary education out there in the wilderness for three years. And then he went home for about 14 more years, so total maybe a 17 years, before he really got involved in writing letters and visiting churches and teaching Christians, you know, before they understood all this stuff. And who was the teacher that did him the first three years? Well, the Lord himself, you see. He says in, in Galatians chapter 1, <coughs> uh, I think it is Galatians chapter 1, as soon as he gets saved, on the road to Damascus, he says in, uh, uh, well, let's notice in Galatians 1.15, it says, When it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace 
to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. See, he's the, the uh, one given primarily to the Gentiles, even though he's a devout Jew. He says, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and I returned again to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained there for 15 days. And I saw nobody else except James, the Lord's brother, who didn't believe in him until after the resurrection. First uh, Corinthians uh, 15, I think it's verse 8 or so. Now concerning the things which I write, indeed I lie not. After that, he says, I went to the region of Syria and Cilicia. I was unknown to the face of the churches in Judea, which were in Christ. Uh, they, hearing of me only, is the one who formerly persecuted, now preaches the faith which, they, which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God. I mean, then notice verse 1 of chapter 2. Fourteen years later, I went to Jerusalem with Barnabas, who came up to get Paul, and also took Titus with me. And he went up by revelation. And uh, you know, in chapter 3 of, of Ephesians, it says that the Lord is the one who gave him this instruction there in the wilderness. So he got a personal seminary education from the Lord himself because Paul was the one who is the steward of, the, of this dispensation, and he's the primary agent that God used to convey New Testament grace teaching to us. Uh, so grace teaching is going to be found primarily in Paul's writings and then James uh, and Jude, his half, Jesus' half-brothers, as well as Peter and John, are the other uh, four people that are supplemental writers to Paul as far as grace teaching is concerned. You know, a lot of guys, I know who Manny calls his uh, program Grace, he includes grace and he does almost everything but grace. It's just like, you know, some of the cults who I have a guy, you know, he came by and he says, well, we have the same Jesus. I said, no, we don't. See? But they twist the word grace to mean something other than unmerited favor from God. See? Uh, the Mosaic Law was legal to the core, so was the Sermon on the Mount. See? The Sermon on the Mount is not your rule for conduct for today. And, uh, if you don't see that, you're going to be very confused. You're going to allegorize scripture and a lot of other things that are going to not be beneficial for you. All right, so these are just a few of the spiritual blessings that are ours to enjoy. Um, hopefully next week we'll look at Ephesians chapter 4, where uh, Paul says there are some things that we need to maintain. We don't create these things, but we need to maintain these truths in our mind. And if we do that, it will help us in our relationship with other people. See? Uh, if we see ourselves as brothers and sisters in the body of Christ then our priority is going to be, or ought to be, with reference to fellow Christians over that even of unsaved people. Galatians 6.10 says, Do good to all men, but especially to those of the household of faith. Okay? Any questions? Or... Okay. All right. Well, we'll glad to have some of you folks with us tonight, and uh, we hope those of you who are on the internet enjoyed it. And uh, if you liked it, just push like, and also push share, so we can reach out to other people. And uh, thanks for being with us. Thanks for you, folks here. We'll finish it out now. Bye.